the final week of the prescription for marriage. And what I want to do today is I want to answer some questions um, and, and just deal with some things that maybe, um, you know, for you, these are some issues you have, but you haven't really expressed them yet to us. And, but these are some things that we see coming up over and over and over um, in, in relationships. And, and so as we begin to meet with couples, these are things that we deal with a lot of times. And so before I get to this, what I want to do is I want to um, just remind us of where we've been and what an incredible job Heather has done. Give her a hug when you see her today. Um, I mean, she has killed it. And here's the thing. The, it's out of her comfort zone. I love this. She hates it. And, and so getting up here is really, really hard for her. But, uh, man, God can just use. And, and that's an example of what God wants to do. God wants to take where you are weak and unconfident. And God wants to use you to be confident and strong. And so just because you may not see the ability in you does not mean God's not going to use you. And so that's what God has done through this series. And so week one, um, here's kind of what we want you to understand. The greatest person that is worth pursuing is the one that is found at the foot of Jesus. You want to find somebody who's worthy of pursuing? Find them at the foot of the cross. Find them at Jesus. Find them where you're supposed to. Find them right here with their knees bent saying, God, I'm going after you. And then if I find somebody, great. Listen, if you're already married, husbands, wives, where you need to be is you need to be found with Jesus. The greatest thing that I see in my wife is I see it every morning right before I leave. She has her Bible, and she has a chair. Everybody has a chair in the house. You know what I'm talking about? Like, that's, that's a dad's chair. That's mom's chair. She has this chair at the kitchen table when we go eat. Like, you don't sit in mom's chair. Um, but that's where she does her Bible study every morning. And when I'm walking out the door, sitting there at the kitchen table, she has her Bible. She has her notebook. She's taking notes. She's writing down. She's putting in what God is saying to her, and she's reading her Bible. Do you know how I know our marriage is going to make it? Because of that. It's not because of what I'm doing. It's not because of what she's doing. It's not because we're nice to each other, we're gracious to each other, or anything like that. It's because we are both found in the word of God. And we are building our, our foundation on something that is solid and can be built on. And so here's the thing. You want to find somebody, find them at the foot of the cross. Here's the thing. If you're going to be found, be found at the foot of the cross. You as husbands, you need to be leading the way. You don't need to be passive. You don't need to be timid in your relationship with the Lord. You need to be strong and outspoken in your relationship with Jesus, leading your wife and leading your family. Wives, you need to be strong and outspoken about your relationship with the Lord. You need to be leading the way in your relationship with the Lord. Let people see and know where they can find you. You can find me at the foot of the cross every time. That's week one. Week two is this. Jesus can heal anything. That is broken no matter how long it has been broken. If you'll just walk with it. Remember we talked about a woman who had had an issue of sickness and disease for 12 years. And then a girl who was 12 years old. And the dad came and said, Jesus, can you heal my daughter? And while he, he's trying to get to this little girl, this woman who has been sick for 12 years. All of a sudden, says Jesus, and reaches out and touches him, and she gets healed. And you're watching somebody get what you've desired for so long. You're watching somebody get the healing, the miracle that you've been waiting on for so long. And that dad decides, I'm giving up. I'm not going to do it. We're going to go away. And Jesus says, no, walk with me to your house. Walk with me. Here's what we don't know. We don't know how long it's going to take. We don't know how long the journey is going to be. We don't know how tough the journey is going to be. We don't know how many hills you have to climb over, how many mountains you have to climb up. We don't know how many people you're going to encounter all along the way. All we know is Jesus said, walk with me. And some of you today, here's what you need to do. You're trying to come up with everything that you can in order to make your relationship right. And Jesus is just saying, walk with me. It's a journey. It's a process. It's going to take time, but walk with me with me and you're making every excuse to do everything else well maybe I'll do this maybe I'll do that maybe I'll go here maybe we'll go see this maybe we'll go see that and Jesus is just saying just walk with me 
And when we get there, everything's going to be fine. But you have to walk with me so that we can get there. Walk with him. That's the second thing. The third thing that we saw is this. I've never seen a relationship that is fully sold out to Jesus. I've never seen a couple that loves Jesus with all of their heart and is totally and completely sold out to Jesus that is in marriage trouble, ever. Here's the thing. The reason your marriage is struggling is because your relationship with Jesus is not right. I'm just going to tell you, your relationship with Jesus is not right. That's why your marriage is struggling. That's why your relationship is struggling. If your marriage with Jesus is right, you can't help but love and treat people the way that God has called and created you to treat people. And so here's the thing. You want a better marriage? It is all focused around Jesus, period. That's why people don't like coming and sitting and talking with me about their relationship because most of the time people want to come and complain. Well, he's this way, she's this way. If they would just do this different, if they would just treat me different, if they would just act different. And I'm like, yes, they're doing a lot of things wrong, but I don't care because what's broken is your relationship with Jesus. That's what I'm going to focus on. That's what I want to fix. And when I fix that, I promise this fixes itself. Promise. I've never not seen it work. Here's the thing. I see it not work when they don't work on this. And so here's the thing. Today what I want to do is I want to answer some questions that that we face when we meet um, with couples. And the first thing I want us to look at is this baggage. And, And here's what we run into a lot of times when we meet with couples. A lot of times what happens is you don't even realize it, but you're bringing baggage into a relationship. And some of you, you've been married for a long time and you still don't recognize that how you grew up, the way that you grew up, what you saw your parents doing, how you saw your parents treating each other, how you saw your parents responding to each other, everything like that is baggage that you're bringing into the relationship. And so now when you get into a situation, the problem is you're going to respond by what you've seen. You're going to respond in a way that you've seen your parents respond. See, Heather and I grew up totally and completely different. Heather grew up and she was very wealthy growing up. Had a lot of money. Her first car was a Lexus. My first car was a baby blue Ford Tempo. There's a minor price gap in between those two things. I listen. I remember um, when I got that car. It's like yesterday. It was the most disappointing day of my life. Um, I was. I had to pay for my own car when I turned sixteen. My parents weren't buying me a car. My mom and dad. Uh, my dad was an administrator and a teacher and coach at a school. Um, my mom worked at the school. She was a cheerleading coach. Um, and, and so, like, you don't get into teaching to become a millionaire. Okay, it just, it doesn't happen. And and so like we didn't, uh, we didn't have a ton of money. I went to a private school because my parents worked at the private school. Heather went to the private school because her parents paid for her to go to the private school. Two completely different things. And so I, I I remember I'm turning 16. I've got to buy my own car. I've got $4,500. That's it. And so I, I had worked my tail off over the summers trying to get enough money to buy a car. I started looking on Auto Trader and I'm like, I want a Tahoe. I'm gonna be sick. And then I realized I'm like $55,000 short of a Tahoe. So I'm a little disappointed and I'm trying to figure out how I can get $55,000 in a month. Um, and every way I came up with was not good and would not allow me to stay on this stage preaching. Um, and so I, I, I just start looking and all of a sudden my grandpa calls me and he's like, Johnny, he's like, I found you a car. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. And my grandpa, he's an oil man. My grandpa had some money. Guy drove caddies. I mean, this guy, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, and so I'm thinking, come on, man, you know, give me a car. And I'm like, what do you, what do you got? And uh, he's like, I found you. He goes, there's this couple in our town. He goes, they have an RV and they pull this car behind it. Only has like 11,000 miles. They want $4,200. I was like, I get to save $300? This is amazing. He's like, you want it? I'm like, yes, what is it? And he's like, it's in immaculate condition. I'm like, it sounds like it. 
And he's like, it's a light blue Ford Tempo. I'm like, I don't know what that is, but it sounds amazing. In my mind, I'm thinking Corvette-ish. I'm like, yes, I love it. Never seen one before in my life. So my mom's like, hey, how about I drive and go get it from your grandpa tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah, he lives in Beaver, five hours away. So she drives up there so that she could get back and be here when I get out of school and it's sitting there. So all day long, like I'm pumped. I'm like, come on. I'm like, guys, guess what? I'm getting my car today. When we come out, my car's going to be in the parking lot. I cannot wait. Like y'all got to come out and see it. This is so cool. Now remember, I'm in a private school. The cars I park in between is a Porsche 911 Turbo, a BMW, and a Range Rover. And I'm like, don't ding my door, people. Ridiculous. And, and so, like, I, I, I am so excited, and, like, the bell rings, and I'm like, I'm like, come on, guys, see my car. Yes. I'm like, it's a Ford Tempo. They're like, what's that? I'm like, God, Corvette-ish. I don't know. Like, this is awesome. And so I run outside and literally standing there, my mom is waving <laughs> next to a four-door baby blue Ford Tempo. If you've never seen one, Google it. They're beautiful cars. And like I go outside and I'm like, she's not here, guys. <laughs> go back in. I, I don't know. And it's like parked like right in front. And like, you know, normally like 16 birthdays, like they put a big bow on it. Like we had one of those little bows that go like on presents, you know, and it was like sitting on top of it and stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, ah. Uh. And she's like, Johnny, Johnny, here it is, Johnny. And I'm like, oh, I don't know who that lady is. They're like, that's your mom. I'm like, no, it's not. And that is definitely not my car. And so I, listen, I drove a baby blue Ford Tempo. And there's nothing that will keep you more humble than a baby blue Ford Tempo. I mean, rolling up in a date, yeah, baby blue Ford Tempo. That sucker, it was a four-cylinder, so when you hit 70, it shook. It just, it, like it had seat massagers. Whether you wanted them on or not, I mean, you would be driving at 70 and just... <laughs> I mean, it was, that, I, I thought that engine's going to drop out at some point because I pushed it so hard. And then, like, you hit 80 and it's just... <laughs> so loud, you can't even get the radio loud enough to hear anything. Like, it's just screaming. This is my car. This is how I grew up. Heather grew up a little different. So you can imagine coming into a relationship how the baggage that she's carrying and the baggage that I'm carrying is a little different. One of the first times I come home from dinner, we get home from the honeymoon. I mean, it's that lovey phase. Babe, I miss you. Do you have to go to work? You know, yes, you know, um, and, and everything. So I go to work and, and I come home and I'm standing there and I'm like, where's dinner? Well, not to mention the night before, she cooked chicken Alfredo, and she did not cook a lot growing up. <laughs> she cooked for like 47 people. Like, it, it's just us two, and she brings it out, and it is stacked up this high. And I'm like, gum. She's like, yeah, I didn't know how much I needed to cook. And so, and so the next night, I come home, and I'm like, hey, uh, you know, where's dinner? She's like, what do you mean? Are we not eating? She's like, yeah, where do you want to go? <laughs> Cafe Heather? I'm like, what do you mean, where do I want to go? She's like, we eat out tonight. Who eats out tonight? We don't make much money. Like, we can't afford to eat out. I was making $18,000 a year when we first got married. 18000 That's, I'd like... You, you can't do anything with 18000 After you paid all the bills, you are taking a loan. It's terrible. And, and so, like, she comes home and she's like, well, we always go out and eat. When I grew up, my baggage, we ate out maybe five times a year as a family. Heather, the way she grew up, she ate out at least five times a week. <laughs> 
And, and so now all of a sudden there's some expectations walking into the relationship that, listen, they're not bad. They're just uncommunicated. And then these unexpressed expectations, this baggage that you're bringing into the relationship can all of a sudden cause frustration because you don't know what to do with it. The way you discipline, the way you discipline kids, sometimes you're dragging that in, the way you fight. Some of you are screamers and yellers and all of a sudden a fight breaks out and you're arguing with each other and you go from zero to 9,000 like that. And it's just like, what in the world happened? And the other person, they're silent. They don't say anything. They just stand there. And you won't say anything. You won't do anything. Like, like you just stand there and you just walk away. And you're like, I'm wondering why this is happening. Could it be it's because what you've seen? And so now what you've seen is how you act and respond? And, and some of you are just cool and collective. Oh, I know. I'm so sorry. I, I, will, I, I will change that. And, and you're just... Obviously, not Shanna. <laughs> and, so, and so some of you are just kind and sweet and just everything's just, uh, you know, okay. And you're wondering, why does this come? Because you watched your parents do it that way. And so now all of a sudden you're bringing this baggage into the relationship. And you don't even understand sometimes why it's happening. The way you discipline kids, you bring it in. For me... When I got disciplined, it was not a conversation that we had. My dad was like, boy, get upstairs and bend over now. And then he would come downstairs and I'd change my attitude because he changed it for me. Heather's dad did things a little different. He would have an hour-long conversation with her. How do you feel? Why do you think you did this? What do you think you need to do next time to maybe change that? How do you think this affected everybody else around you? What do you think you're going to do the next time? So when our kids started getting older and it came time to discipline, I walked upstairs and I came down pretty quick. And Heather's like, that was a quick conversation. I was like, there wasn't any talking going on. She's like, what do you mean? She's like, well, how do they feel? I was like, pretty sore. She's like, what? You think they'll do it again? I go, not if they don't want that again. And she had an expectation that I was going to walk up there and she goes, well, that's not what my dad did. I said, I ain't your dad. And she said, you didn't just talk to him? I said, no. I said, I beat the tar out of him. And they better not do it again. But here's the thing, some of you, you're walking into the relationship and you have this baggage and you don't understand. And those are just a couple of examples. There's a lot of things that you carry into a relationship that you don't even understand. The way you spend money, whether you save, go on vacation, what you do, what you're doing with retirement, whether you go get loans, whether you don't. Like Heather's family, they had money and so here's the thing, they don't like debt. So they pay cash for everything. And then we were looking at a car and she's like, we need to pay cash for it. I was like, what cash? It's like, I'd love to. But if you got a tree that is going to produce some cash for me, we'll go get it. And so now all of a sudden she's got this baggage she's bringing into it. And she's like, well, I just don't like having debt. I was like, I don't either. But we don't have an option. Like we've got to get from point A to point B. And so here's the thing, you've got to understand these things, you're bringing these things into it. It's not bad, like those things aren't bad. How she was raised, what she was raised, what she thought is not bad. The way I was raised, how it was, what happened, those things are not bad, they're just different. And sometimes that difference can cause issues that you don't even realize it's causing. I didn't even realize this was an issue. I didn't even realize I needed to think about this. I didn't even realize I needed to think about grades and school. Heather has an expectation. She wants the kids to make straight A's. That was not my expectation. I was just like, just graduate. <laughs> Two completely different expectations. Like she's like, you better make A honor roll every time. I was like, I've never seen A honor roll in all of my life, ever, ever. My expectation is just make it to the next grade. Whatever you have, get by. But two completely different expectations going that we don't even understand. 
She was like, I always made straight A's. And I was like, listen, if it was P.E., I got an A. Anything else, I mean, B at best. I'm not going to lie, B at best. She's like, seriously? I'm like, yes. She's like, well, you couldn't have been my kid. <laughs> like, Thanks, babe. But listen, maybe there's some expectations sometimes. And you're trying to figure these things out because you come from two completely different places. So you've got to talk through these things. And you've got to be able to understand these expectations that you have with each other. The second thing is this. Maybe what we face a lot of times in a relationship and a conversations that we have is an unbelieving spouse. Maybe you're walking through the doors alone every single week and it's hard. It's hard coming to church. It's hard coming to church by yourself. It's hard coming to church when your spouse stays home. You've been praying for them. You want them to come. You want them to come through the doors, but they just don't. Here's what I want to encourage you with. 1 Corinthians seven fourteen. it says this. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. Meaning this. If you will continue to be faithful, you can change a hard heart and soften a hard heart. Listen, when we came through the doors, here's what I want you to understand. We came through the doors, and I talked about these chairs. Some churches, what they do is they put some kind of curtains in front of empty chairs and everything like that. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want us doing that. I want you to be able to see the opportunity that we have in front of each other because we've never had this opportunity before. Well, we've never been able to um, have seats where people can come and be a part of what we're doing. And so I was like, I want people to see them, and then I want people to start praying over them. And I want people to start thinking about what is going on and uh, the people that could come through the doors and, and fill that seat. And I said that one time, and then... Kelly Abbey posted this about her dad. That's Terry. You all know Terry. Terry stands in the parking lot. He leads our um, parking lot team out there. He leads our security team here at the church. But what you don't know about Terry is Terry didn't go to church before he came to church here. And this is what Kelly wrote. If you don't believe in miracles, I'll show you one. Right here, this chair. It was never filled most of my life. It was always prayed for. It was prayed hard for, but never filled. The last six years or so, it has been filled. Not only filled, but encouraged. This chair now holds a miracle, a servant, a God-centered dad, a prayer warrior, a Bible reader, a person changed. Miracles are real, and this is the proof. A mom and a daughter, every time they came to church, they would come to church and sitting next to them was an empty seat because dad wasn't there. A mom and a daughter would walk through every single week and they would say, I want dad to come. And when they would sit down, they would see an empty chair next to him and they would pray, someday dad's going to fill that seat. Someday dad's going to be here. Someday mom's going to come. Someday they're going to fill this seat. And every week they would walk through the doors and they would be faithful. And they would be faithful to come. They would be faithful to pray. And finally, dad showed up. And finally, the seat that they had been praying for, dad showed up. Finally, the seat that they had been weeping over and asking, I just want my dad to come to church. He comes through the doors, he gets saved, and now he serves every single week. And if there's something at the church, he comes through the door. Here's what I want to encourage you with. I don't know your situation, but I know this. God can soften any hard heart. There's not a heart hard enough that God can't soften. You stay faithful and you keep praying. Don't give up. Don't know how long it is. Don't know how, how hard the journey is. Keep walking with Jesus. Stay faithful. Let them see Jesus in you. Let them find you at the foot of the cross. You stay faithful. So that then God softens their heart. And God changes them from the inside out. But then here's the thing. When God gets a hold of them, he doesn't just get a hold of them. He changes the entire family from the inside out. Come on, somebody. 
But here's the thing. Friends don't let friends pray alone. If you know somebody who's coming alone, put your arm around them and pray for them. You know somebody who keeps coming through the door every single week and they are, they are dragging their kids, fighting them through the parking lot and it's hard because they've got four kids and they're coming through the doors and they just keep coming every single week and you can tell the stress level is about to hear. Don't let them come alone. Don't let them pray alone. Put your arm around them and help them. Put your arm around them and say, you're not walking this journey alone. You've got people who love you and care about you and we're praying the same thing. That's a miracle waiting to happen. That's a miracle waiting to happen. That's a mom who's going to walk through the doors, fall on her knees and give her heart to Jesus. That's a dad who's going to walk through the doors, be broken because of the life that he's living, give his heart to Jesus and be changed forever. That's a miracle waiting to happen. And we're praying with you. We're not going to let you walk on this alone. We're praying with you. Friends, don't let friends pray alone. If you see somebody, don't ever let them sit by themselves. Ever. Let them know when they walk through the doors here, they're not alone. You, you've got somebody. You don't know me. That's all right. Listen, sometimes when I go into a restaurant, I don't know people, and it's weird. I get in trouble all the time. I get in trouble at the hospital just walking into rooms. Uh, sir, you can't just do that. I'm like, ah, we're good. I'm like, hey, we're, just, we're friends. What's her name? I have no clue. <laughs> but here, here's the thing. Don't let them be alone. How can I pray for you? What do you need? When you walk through the door, I'm going to help you at your car. Text me next week. When you get here, I'll meet you at your car and I'll help you in. When you get here next week, I will sit with you in church. Well, I'll come pick you up. Let's go to lunch together. I'll pay for your lunch. Taco Bell or something. It's just getting expensive. <laughs> Third thing is this. The widow. Some of you, we've been talking about a marriage series, but you don't have a relationship. Your spouse has died. I remember my grandparents. My grandparents were married for over 60 years and they never spent a night apart until my grandma died. My grandpa didn't know what to do with himself. Some of you are walking through the doors and you don't know what to do with yourself. You're walking through the doors and you feel lost because your purpose was so wrapped up with each other and now that you don't have each other, you don't know what to do. I want to encourage you because you may... Be lonely, but you're not done. It may be different, but it's not over. And here's what happens a lot of times in kids, grandkids. I, I want to encourage you with your mom and dad. Don't let them walk through this alone. Call them. Talk to them. Invite them over. Let them spend time. They're not just a babysitting tool. Spend time with them. Love on them. Encourage them. Here's what the word says. It says this. I'm reminded of your sincere faith in 2 Timothy 1.5. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother. And then in your mother. And now it's in you. Here's what I want you to understand about what God wants to do through you. God wants to use you to influence generations to come. Your kids and your grandkids, they are a legacy and a heritage that you have. They are the future. I'm so grateful for grandparents. Listen, this is not a grandparent's cup of tea. My mom and dad drive from Norman every single week. Did you know worship, They like the loud music, the bass, um, the noise, like it's not what they love. Like when we go to their house, it's not like we're walking in and it's like, <gasps> you know, like they're like, yeah, Johnny. No, like they got like Gaithers playing in the background. <laughs> but here's the thing. They come because they're supporting the next generation. They walk through the doors because they see a future. And so what they've decided is we're going to sacrifice our desires in order to see a better future for you. I don't have to love everything, but what I can do is I can support you. I am so grateful for the grandparents that walk through the doors that say, this may, everything here is not my cup of tea. It's not how it's been done in the past. It's not everything I love, but I'm coming 
Because I love my kids and I love my grandkids and I want to support them. And I want to see them sitting in church. And I know this is a place they'll be sitting. So I'm coming and supporting them. That's, that's your legacy. That's your calling. That's your purpose. Don't give up on it. Keep pushing. Keep fighting because you're not just influencing this generation. You're influencing the next generation. That's what 2 Timothy 1.5 says. We've seen it in you. Now we see it in their mom. And now we see it in them. Because of you, your faith is being passed down from generation to generation. Just because your spouse has gone does not mean your calling and purpose is over. Keep fighting. Keep pushing. Keep being obedient to what God has called you to. And the last thing is this money. And this is where in the first service it got really quiet. And everybody was like, oh, I've got a meeting. I've got to get to, I forgot about. Because here's the awkward thing. Some of you, you are in terrible financial struggles right now. Your marriage is falling apart and part of the reason is because you don't know how to spend money. No, you know how to spend money. You don't know how to save money. That's not the problem. <laughs> You can spend it like crazy. Listen, some of you have a super nice house. You have super nice cars. You have boats. You have motorcycles. You have vacations that are just unbelievable. You have clothes that are just incredible. But the problem is every time you get to the end of the month, you don't have enough money to pay for all that. But yet you want it and you keep buying it. And so then what ends up happening is the stress of all of that is put onto the relationship and you continue to fight. Because you're trying to impress people who in the end of the day, they're not crawling into bed with you. It's your spouse. And you're looking at each other and you're saying, we don't need this. We don't need this. This is putting us in a hard situation. Let's not spin like this. Let's not buy these things. Let's not do these things. Let's live within our means. When I got my first car, one of the things that my mom and dad told me is, listen, you don't need to go get a loan and go buy a car. Buy a car that you can afford. And from that point, we've taken that. And here's the thing. When we first got married, we got a credit card that, got, that had a $1,000 limit. That's it. Because we didn't want to put ourselves in a situation to where all of a sudden we're trying to dig ourselves out of a financial hole that we can't afford. So my mom and dad and her mom and dad were super wise in encouraging this for us. Hey, don't do this. So guess what we did? We got that $1,000 credit card and guess what? We spent it like crazy. I mean, we went shopping. We were like, free money. And so they were like, how are you paying for this? And I was like, this thing right here, where's that money coming from? I have no clue, but it just always shows up. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden, guess what? I mean, it was maxed out. And I'm so grateful that I didn't go get a five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 credit card. Because then all of a sudden, I'm having to pay all this back in, in something that I can't afford. Listen, your responsibility is to take care of each other, not try and impress everybody else. Stop trying to impress everybody. Live within your calling. Live within your calling. I'm a pastor. I'm not a millionaire. I like nice things, but guess what? I don't get to buy a lot of nice things because I don't make a lot of money. But guess what? I love my calling and I'm willing to sacrifice things to be obedient to what God has called me to do. Some of you need to begin to understand your calling is more important than your things. And you need to live within your calling, the means of your calling. And for some of you, God has blessed you tremendously. Fantastic. Take me to dinner. <laughs> but here's the thing. You want God's blessing on your life, but you're unwilling to do it God's way. God bless me. Bless me. But you're unwilling to do it God's way. You want God's blessing, you have to do it God's way. Sometimes when we open this back here and we collect the tithes and the offerings, there's 20s in there, 100 in there, different things like that. Here's what God calls us to. Look at this in Malachi. Here's what's going on in Malachi. The prophet Malachi is taking and receiving offerings. They brought the offerings uh, to the priest, and then the priest, what the priest does is then turn around, and, and the priest sacrifices them for the people. Well, what they were bringing is they were bringing lame and crippled animals so that they could sacrifice them. They were bringing the leftovers. They were bringing what nobody else wanted. 
And what God had called and told the people, listen, what you need to bring is your best because that's what I'm going to give. I'm giving you my best, my son. So what I want you to give is I want you to give your best. But what they were doing is they weren't going, and, and I know we've got a lot of show people in here and different things like that who show. Here's the sacrifice that God wanted from you. That animal that you go and show is the one that God wanted you to sacrifice. He didn't want you going out and looking through the herd and going, that one looks terrible. God, you can have that one. That one's got, that one's got five legs. It's got like one coming out its head. Let's sacrifice that one. And we laugh, but that's what they were doing. We're like, how would they do that to God? But then here, look at what Malachi says. Will man rob from God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and in your contributions? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby, put me to the test, says the Lord. God says this, put me to the test. If you bring the full tithe, put me to the test. You can't put me to the test just throwing a 20 in. You can't put me to the test just throwing what you have in your pocket and just saying, God, I'm good. God says, no. Put me to the test when you are obedient. And he says, bring the full tithe to the storehouse. And then put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down on you a blessing until there is no more need. Look at what God wants to do if you will just be obedient. And here's the thing. Some of you get it so backwards because what you do is you go and you look and you're like, I've got a house payment. I've got food to buy. I've got these kids events. I've got all this stuff that I have to pay for. I've got motorcycles and boats and I've got vacation and everything like that. And then I've got $50 left over at the end of the month, but yet I'd still like to go buy some clothes. God, you can have 10. And then we're like, God bless me. God, we trust you with our finances. Bless me. God, we want you to pour your blessing out on us. God, just just pour over us. This is what we desire. God, look at what I did. And God's saying, I know you're not trusting me. Because here's the thing. You want my blessing. Then what you do first is the very first check you write is you say, God, this goes to your house. This is your house, 10%. Because God will always do more. And what Heather and I have seen over the years, God does more every time with 90% than I can do with 100. Every single time. I don't know how he does it. My math does not add up. But listen, you remember, I wasn't an A student. But it does not add up. But every time God does it. God does it in a way that I cannot, I, I cannot fathom. I cannot wrap my head around. But, but here's the thing. You want God's blessing? Then do it God's way. Stop blaming God when you won't do it God's way. Because God says, test me. Let's see. Let's see. Test me. You want to see what God will do? You want to see how God can turn things around? You want to see how God can make things right? Test me. Be obedient. And then you know what? My responsibility as your pastor is this. I have to be obedient to do what God has called us to do as a church and and to steward that money in an honorable way. That where when I stand up here, I have nothing to hang my head about. I, I have nothing to be guilty about. Because what we are doing is we are seeing people saved and we are doing everything we can to see husbands and wives, relationship, restored kids turn and give their heart to Jesus, see people in the community come to Jesus in every way help that we can. And so then when I stand before God, listen, you are not held accountable for the funds of the church as they come in. I am. And so you better be for sure that I'm going to do everything I can. But then not only that, we have a board, we have overseers that watch and see and check everything so that we are doing everything above board. Because listen, I have to steward, not my money, God's money. And you think when I become an accountant for God, that's not a big deal? It's a huge deal. And so here's, here's the thing. You, be obedient to God. Some of you, Your marriage is struggling because of your finances, but you're unwilling to do it God's way. You want to do it your way and get God's blessing. And God's saying, no, 
And so maybe today before you leave, you just need to put your arm around each other and just say, we're doing it God's way. How are we going to make it happen? I don't know. But it's God's way. It's God's way. We're going to cut other stuff out. We don't need the motorcycles. We want the motorcycles, but we don't need them. We don't need the vacation home. I watched a couple, they came in and they had tons of debt and their marriage was struggling and we talked about it. The next week they walked in and they had sold over $100,000 worth of debt. In one week, $100,000 worth of debt. You can do it. And listen, when they walked in, they had this huge burden on their back. And when they came through the doors the next week, man, they were walking with their chest out, their chin up. They felt so good. Because they weren't burdened to impress people. They were going to be obedient to what God had called them to do. And so today, listen, here's what I want to encourage you with. I don't know where you are, uh, but Jesus is the only hope for your relationship. Jesus is the only hope. If you will put Jesus number one and chase after Jesus, he will change everything. Period. He can restore anything. Listen, we saw it in Terry. There was an empty seat. A mom and a daughter came through the doors every day and they prayed for that empty seat. There's some miracles that are going to start happening. There's some miracles that are going to start taking place. Your job, your purpose, it's not over. Keep fighting. Be obedient. Will you pray with me?